In the previous couple of videos, we've looked at the harmonic oscillator as a model system for a vibrating chemical bond. We've got two masses here, mass 1 and mass 2 of each of the atoms. They're connected by some spring with a spring constant k, and uh, they have some distance apart, which is r. And the spatial coordinate we're interested in is, is the displacement from the equilibrium bond distance, this x equals r minus r naught, the equilibrium bond length. And we showed that for the harmonic oscillator, the energy levels for the quantum system, when you solve the Schrodinger equation, are equal to this h, Planck's constant, times nu, the vibrational frequency, times uh, this n, some integer, plus one half. So these energy states we have plotted here. There's the potential energy function, the one half kx squared. And inside of here, we have the lowest energy state is one half h nu, and then the next energy state is three halves h nu, five halves, seven halves, etc. So we have a bunch of evenly spaced energy levels inside this potential energy uh, well here. And this frequency of vibration is going to depend on two things. It's equal to one over two pi, the square root of the spring constant. So as this potential gets thinner and thinner and much stiffer, this frequency of vibration will go up and the energy levels will get higher up further spaced apart and as the reduced mass goes up the frequency will go down. So the reduced mass being the product of the two masses divided by their sum. So the, that's what affects what these energy levels are and where their placement is. But now we want to look at um, some applications to infrared spectroscopy for some vibrating diatomic molecules. So we know for spectroscopy we're interested in the changes between energy levels. So for infrared spectroscopy, for vibrational spectroscopy, we have a selection rule which says that the change in n, the change in this quantum number, is equal to plus or minus one. And that's what we call a selection rule. There's some uh, very deep quantum mechanical ideas about why this is the case, but for now we're just going to accept it as a postulate. And so transitions which obey the selection rule are said to be allowed transitions, and those which don't are said to be forbidden. So if we look on our graph here, a change of plus or minus equal plus or minus one for n will give us an energy level of a delta e which is the difference between one of these two spacings here. And since all of the energy levels are evenly spaced apart, any transition under the harmonic oscillator model in a perfectly quadratic potential, any transition will give us the same frequency because it's going to be changing the same amount of energy as they're all evenly spaced apart. So if we have a process of absorption, like many IR techniques are, then that means that delta n equals plus one. And similarly, at, the, at room temperature at 298 Kelvin, standard conditions, uh, because these energy spacings are usually quite far apart, according to statistical mechanics, uh, almost a vast majority of the particles will exist in the ground state. A vast majority of vibrating molecules will be in this ground state. So. For IR spectroscopy, the great majority of what we're measuring is particles going from n equals 0 to n equals 1. But we'll just solve this for the general case. So our delta E is going to be equal to the E of n plus 1 minus E of level n, just the separation between these two energy levels here. And the E of n plus 1 is h nu n plus 1 plus 1 half. The energy of E n is h nu n plus 1 half. And you should be able to notice that everything in here except for this 1 is going to cancel and they have the same unit on the outside. So our final result is that delta E is just equal to h nu. So this frequency is really going to be the determining factor in what our energy spacings are and what uh, bands we observe on whatever IR spectrum we measure. So this new 
which we can call new observed if we like is just going to be equal to the same thing we have up here this 1 over 2 pi square root of k over mu so that will be the frequency we observe on some uh, IR spectrum similarly there's another unit we could use called omega bar which spectroscopists like to use because they like to use the units of inverse centimeters or wave numbers as we sometimes call them and that's just taking this and dividing it by the speed of light and also making sure to use the units of centimeters per second for the speed of light so to recap on that we have C the speed of light used in centimeters per second if we're using this omega bar here we have the omega bar quantity is going to be in inverse centimeters or wave numbers and our k, our spring constant, the units we typically use for that is newtons per meter. In the previous videos we showed that the force acting on a particle in this type of potential is equal to minus kx. So every meter you displace it away you're gonna get k newtons of force acting on you so this newtons per meter shows how many uh, newtons of force are pulling the particle back for every meter you displace it away okay so that's that's pretty much what's going on there we can try to do us uh, an example problem to look at this so let's look at for the F2 molecule just fluorine bonded to fluorine and it's also important to note that you use the proper isotopes because if you'll note this reduced mass here has the masses of the atoms in it and if you use different isotopes you're gonna have a different reduced mass and thus a different frequency so this is why different isotopes show up on different places in an IR spectrum because you have different masses and thus you get different frequencies so we always want to specify which isotopes we're talking about if there are multiple possible isotopes in there. Okay, so for fluorine, the observed frequency of vibration is 916.6 inverse centimeters or wave numbers. So what we want to do here is we're going to derive what the spring constant is under the harmonic oscillator approximation for F2. Okay, so we have omega bar. Uh, we have this equation down here, and we're going to try to get k by itself. So first we're going to square it. Omega squared equals 1 over 2 pi squared c squared k over mu. And then to simplify that, what we're just going to have is k multiply all the stuff on the bottom by both sides we have oh sorry when you square it you get a 4 here this is a 4 that 2 pi goes to a 4 pi squared 4 pi squared c squared mu omega bar squared okay so a whole bunch of stuff that's all in a numerator so if we want to plug in specific values then we're going to have k equals 4 pi squared speed of light in centimeters per second is 2.998 times 10 to the tenth centimeters per second it's 10 to the eighth meters per second but 10 to the tenth centimeters per second squared then the reduced mass let's take a look at what mu would equal so mu equals m1 over m2 m1 times m2 over m1 plus m2 so in this case these are both 19 amu so 19 times 19 amu over 19 plus 19 atomic mass units so that's going to give us this 19 can cancel with that 19 or with, with the sum of these two 19s so there's going to be a 2 here that remains after we cancel out and sum those 
and we'll get 19 over 2. And we have AMU times AMU on top, AMU squared over AMU plus AMU, so 1 AMU. So we have AMU squared over AMU, which cancels to just give atomic mass units. And 1 AMU equals something like, let me see if I have it written down here somewhere. I think 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms, which is about the mass of a proton or a neutron, uh, approximately what those uh, subatomic particles equal. Remember, electrons are very, very light relative to protons and neutrons, so it's just the protons and neutrons which contribute to the mass. Okay, so plugging in <coughs> the reduced mass up here, we're going to get 19 over 2 is 9.5 times 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms. And then that is also times continuation of this line, this 916.6 inverse centimeters. And we note that we have the correct units because we're going to have a centimeter squared here. We're going to have a centimeters to the minus squared here. So those are going to cancel out. That's good. And if you chug through all the math of that, what you're going to get in the end is K equals 470.4. And the initial unit you'll get, you'll see we have a kilogram here and a one over seconds here. So kilogram per second squared, but we can also note that a kilogram per second squared is equal to a kilogram meter per second squared times one over meter, and kilogram meter per second squared is a newton unit of force, so that's a newton per meter. <clears throat> so in fact, our final answer for K is going to be that our force constant equals 470.4 newtons per meter. And that's pretty typical that you get a force constant which is on the order of hundreds or a few thousand newtons per meter. That's a pretty typical strength for how strong chemical bonds are near these low energy states here. So moving forward we're going to look at this uh, in some more detail, see how good this harmonic approximation is in general, what kind of corrections we can make to it, and then also look at the wave functions of harmonic oscillators uh, in these quadratic potentials.